Hey, Frank. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Good. How are you? Good. Uh, we're really excited to have you. I, you know, um, I'll be honest with you. This is probably the most excited I've been to actually tune in these Instagram lives because there's so much. Uh, we're really just going to go off the tangent here in terms of like everything that you guys are doing at the uh, Video Game History Foundation. Uh, but for those who are uh, going to be watching this video for or just knowing about you for the first time or learning about the Video Game History Foundation, could you give a little bit of an intro about who you are, what sure. you do, and the organization? It's been four years. You'd think I'd have a good like uh, elevator pitch <laughs> intro, but it's like video game preservation is so uh, so hard, and there's so many pieces to it that like it's so hard to like condense it down. But um, the Video Game History Foundation is a nonprofit charity uh, dedicated to uh, preserving the history of games, um, and essentially what we sort of do you can kind of narrow down to uh two things uh that we do um and all of it is related to just making sure that well first of all the history is saved right that, that, that it doesn't disappear but second of all that that uh people can actually study video game history and and can publish things based on it. you know people can write history books um the 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 problem that we see in the world that we think we can help solve uh, is that, it, well, imagine the pre-virus world and you go to Barnes & Noble and you go to the video game section. You know, there's, all of the books are just like strategy guides and art books, you know? You go to the music section, there's like 300 biographies. There. You know, there, there's like actual like history and works of journalism and stuff like that. And, and you don't see it for games and we think it's because there's just not a lot of resources for people who make that kind of stuff. So, uh, so we're creating that archive for people to uh, to use and study. Um, so um, the the picture you're kind of seeing in the background right now is well, that's my house years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> since then, we we've actually uh, you know was, yeah this this picture is actually where I'm sitting right now. This is the uh, a piece of the foundation's library. So we have a wow. physical. Um, we have a physical collection of, uh, most of the video game magazines. Um, well, I should say almost all of them that were published in the U S and then like a good chunk of, uh, international ones that, uh, with, with an emphasis on what was in English. So, you know, we have full runs of basically all the American magazines. Um, but that's just a, that's just a chunk of it. We, we, we focus on the magazines just because it's so, um, it's so, dense with information that would be useful to an historian yep. uh telling the, the, the story of video games because you get things like uh how the games were marketed right like you see the advertising and stuff like that uh you get a sense for like what people thought of games when they came out if you're able to read all the reviews right uh you get um sort of like news and rumors so you could see uh, especially like, you know, people are fascinated, for example, by games that never came out, right? So like, yeah. if you're able to study the media, uh, you can you can see what we know about games that came out. And if they were playable at the time, you might get impressions, stuff like that. Um, but that's just the magazines. The other, the other thing we focus on, um, it's a lot harder because you can't just like go on eBay and buy this, is uh, we focus on uh, collecting the actual, um, developer material from from people who made games uh so we we collect a lot of video game source code um we collect you know sort of unfinished builds and prototypes and stuff like that uh from the people who made them and they're sort of like raw design notes some you know art on paper stuff like that so that uh someone who's studying that game can actually access the archive of that game and, and sort of piece together how it was made and 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 uh publish something based on that so that's that's again i'm not i haven't figured out the elevator pitch but that's <laughs> the, i haven't figured out the like 30 second pitch but that was the like three minute pitch well see that i mean this is what i'm getting at, the amazing work that you guys have been doing out there um because there's such a wealth of knowledge in video games as like the medium itself and we don't it, it's really hard for us to kind of realize because i i guess when you think about a lot of us who grew up with video games in like the 80s and 90s you know we're now coming into you know adults and so now we were finally understanding like kind of the the medium not as a commercial product but as an actual art form and yeah. i think that's one of the the things now is like when 
this medium was produced, it was, you know, let's be honest, it was, it's, it was such a new medium that no one really considered, you know, preserving it. And so I guess my first question for you is, how do you essentially even start like pursuing, like, I guess, like just materials in the first place? Because a lot of the stuff that you're getting, uh, you know, let's be honest, it's, it's really, you're looking for stuff that people don't really know about. Yeah. So how do you even know what, you're almost like, <laughs> let's be real here, you're almost looking for like arcs every time you're trying to like look no, and go out no, there. <laughs> that, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and it's, you know, there's things like, Okay, for example, you know, the, the sort of arc analogy is really good. Like, um, we recently worked with um, the family of a, uh, of a game programmer who, who passed away quite a while ago, I think 2003, um, just kind of going through what he left behind. Yeah. Uh, because he had a really long career in games uh, going back to the late 70s. Um, and he, you know, late seventies through like two thousand one, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's we were literally just like finding giant stacks of poorly labeled floppy disks, right? That were um, ostensibly like a backup of hard drives from like the early nineties, maybe, but they're poorly labeled, and it was a lot of like, you know, I mean, the short version is we're. We're, we're digging through just like finding bits and pieces of games here and there and trying to like assemble the puzzle back together. And uh, we were able to recover, um, you know, at least one game of his that, that no one's ever seen before that we're, we, you know, we haven't, we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Um, so, you know, that's literally just like boxes in a basement, right? Of, yeah. of, of this guy's life is, is one way that we do that kind of thing. Um, I think the, the most powerful tool that we have for this kind of material for like behind the scenes developer material is honestly just uh, being out there and being present and, and just being vocal about it because um, you know, it's, it's not like we're drowning in the stuff, but people tend to come to us now that we've established ourselves um, as that industry friendly um uh, face uh, uh, for 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 people who are uh, trying to save this stuff. So we yeah. we often get you know um, we often get you know old programmers uh, just kind of emailing and being like, hey, are you interested in this? I still have this. Um, we um, we try to work more with the commercial industry so that uh, you know so people so like when. <laughs> So, for example, a really good example of this is that um, last year, uh, Disney and I think it was Nighthawk um, released a, a new product that was um, Aladdin and the Lion King as a combo pack, yep. like the old games. I forget what they called it. Um, but they actually used uh, the original source code for Disney's Aladdin on the Sega Genesis that was from our archives. Wow. Uh, to rebuild the game um and i don't know if anyone in chat has, has played this but there's actually like a i think they called it the final cut of aladdin's in that package where um a programmer who's actually one of our volunteers went in and actually fixed some of aladdin's bugs using the source code and uh you know dug up on un unused features and stuff like that um and, and but, i have to ask uh, you a question here yeah. um why would uh, disney not have had that source or whoever the original developers, why would Disney theoretically not have already had that and then they had to turn to you guys? Um, so for games that are that old, yeah, uh, there wasn't a lot of reason to hold on to the source code. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it's funny, we, we repeated the exact same mistake that the film industry did. Um, there's this you know, really crushing stat from the Film Foundation um, and I, I always get the number wrong, but it's something like 80% of American movies made before 1930 just don't exist anymore. They're gone. Um, and that's because there was no secondary market for these movies. You would make the movies, you'd print them on film, uh, you would sell them to the theaters. And then once the movie was done, once it run its course, it's like, what are you going to do with this thing? Are you going to pay to store it? Yeah. No, you're going to throw it away. You're going to burn it, maybe. Um, and... There was just no notion back in the 20s 
of being able to sell that movie again. There's no such thing as, you know, VCRs. There's not even television yet, right? Like, there's just no notion of, like, we can use this again. Yeah. So they destroyed it. And the same thing happened with video game source code. Like, you can't, you know, you can't take the source code uh, for Aladdin and just, you know, easily, like, port it over to the, the PlayStation, right? It just, it, it's a completely different architecture. Like, yep. it, 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 was, it didn't make a lot of sense to hold on to that stuff um so they didn't uh so i think that's thankfully changed quite a bit in recent years um because for the most part hardware is all kind of the same um not really but you know it's 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 similar enough now between generations that it's fairly trivial to to get something working yes. um given the resources uh so you know we we have this notion now of like remasters from ps3 to four to five or whatever and we didn't have that back in the day uh so a lot of that old source is just gone um so in the case of aladdin in particular um you know you're asking why didn't disney have it well it was virgin who made it back in the day right they made it for disney essentially yeah. and, and i don't even know if disney interactive like bothered archiving things to right. scoop up those wow. rights wow so, so yeah. this is actually a pretty good segue to a question that someone submitted what percentage yeah. of games do you think are lost to history pre ps4 era um games as in actual playable titles i'm gonna say like very few actually like we oh. we are really fortunate um, and when, when, we, when we're talking about games, we're talking about just like the playable data right the cartridge or playable whatever. games but let's just say at this point it, they may no longer be able to be ported over, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. In that it's, context. In terms of source code, like 99.9% .9 is gone. Like, I, I'm very convinced. Wow, 99.9%. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, prior, well, prior to PS4, maybe, okay. Maybe it gets a little lower there, but like, well, if we're we'll talking like 80s and 90s, 80s and 90s source code, if we're talking about every game ever made, um, at least 99%. I mean, like, like wow. there's no one hold, held on to that stuff. There's no reason to. Wow. Um, so you guys but, are actually actively trying to like find source code in, in many yeah. cases every time. So when like a, a studio is shutting down uh, mm -hmm. or let's say like a, a big publisher somehow just, you know, goes out of business, are you like immediately trying to like figure out who's essentially scooping up like the IPs or, you know, like THQ is like a pretty, pretty good example. When they kind of mm -hmm. shut down, were you guys trying to like backtrack where a lot of like their properties were or the rights were all going towards well we don't have nearly the funding it would require to like scoop up the rights to games it's not mm -hmm. something that we're capable of doing um but what we are capable of doing is showing up with a van yep essentially. <laughs> um so we have done that um with some companies uh um I'm not sure if I should name that. <laughs> like, let's, but, but let's keep it like under NDAs that, and all that stuff. But I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's well, it's not it's well, it's not even an NDA thing. It's more like, you know, friend of the company calls me and goes, "Hey, man, show up." <laughs> <Just get over. laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, it's, because it, it's it's just like you know, before they know, just come get some stuff out. Yeah. Um, so you know, we we are good at that. Like, we're good at showing up with the van if people. Uh, if, if we're fortunate enough that we have a contact over there and they they, they want to make sure the stuff is saved before it's, you know, uh, probably thrown in the trash, depending on the situation. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're good at that, but like, we're, we're not, yeah, we're not in a position like, like in the situation you were describing to actually like scoop up the rights to games that's just that's a that's a really large spend and we we just don't have that kind of money well well there is one fascinating uh quote that you put uh not sure if it was to like vice or to like pace magazine but you were discussing when you're kind of like looking through you know materials and whatnot you're actually kind of looking at like kind of the mediums that people least suspect so you're actually like looking at vhs's and mm. in this case like diskettes and whatnot i mean how long is this <laughs> I, it sounds like a very laborious task about like searching through like all this type of material before you finally find something and say, Oh my gosh, like we can't believe this is like here and whatnot. So how often are you still able to kind of get access to even just like VHS tapes or even diskettes that, cause I had to assume a lot of that stuff was probably done for like press 
purposes, right? And yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in a lot of cases, yeah, or sometimes for, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons to record gameplay footage. It might be for, like, at, at a trade show, you might not have a build of the game, but you might have, like, the demo video looping on a monitor somewhere. Uh, you might submit uh, a recording to send uh, to the ESRB for ratings, for example. There's more than just press. Yeah. Um, or you might record footage uh, of a bug in the game and, and give the tape to the programmer sort of thing. So there's 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 a lot of reasons to record footage. Um, mm -hmm. I think the quote you're thinking of, I don't, I don't remember who it was either, but um, essentially, you know, they were asking me, like, what are the sort of holy grail? What, what are, what's the stuff you're looking for? And, and what I what I usually say and I believe is, is that it's not like a game, you know, it's, it's, it's the material that would contextualize that game and help me understand it. Um, it's, it's things like uh, internal like correspondence at the game studio, right? It's, it's things like bug reports, you know, that, that might've survived. It's things like, I mean, you mentioned press material. It's, it's things like the, the marketing collection for that game. It's, uh, you know, we've mentioned early builds. I think source code is maybe the most important uh, of those things. If you have the original source code to the game, I mean, yeah, you can rebuild it, great. But the to me, what's more important is that you can actually like get into how the game works Develop, in yeah. the DNA of the game, and uh, you you can better understand how it works, how the engine works. Um, you know, like. And, and that tells you a little bit more about maybe why decisions were made in the game. You might find pieces of the code that were, I don't know if there's any coders watching, but uh, pieces that were commented out. So if you comment out code, you're basically putting a, a symbol in front of it saying that when you build the game, ignore this part. So if you're, if you, if you're able to read the comments uh, on source code, it, it gets really fascinating because you get things like, notes from the developer about how this thing works or why they're doing this uh or you might get entire pieces of code that are commented out um and uh we've done things like um this is another thing like it's a project i'm working on so i'm not ready to say exactly what game it is but we recently uh, uh acquired the source code to to a, a fairly famous game um and i was able to go through the source code and look at things that were commented out and like rebuild them back into the game and be like, oh, they cut this whole feature from the game. Um, so, you know, you can kind of get a, a little bit more of an insight into the development process if you have the source code. And, uh, and do they ever people... leave comments why they were cutting something out or maybe there, sure. was, maybe there was like a marketing purpose or, you know, yeah. maybe for it's space? Or... like performance reasons, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, this fire effect was awesome, but it was dropping frame. You know, like, yeah. It's like uh, yeah, we see that sometimes. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen comments that are like, marketing made me cut this, but I'm sure that happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, stuff like that. I mean, there's like, like in, that, in the, the game I was just talking about, there was a, we found a whole like section of the game that um, was entirely functional and like fits in the game and I put it back in and it just, it, it fits. It, it, it's not necessary to the plot or anything, but it just fits nicely right where it was supposed to be and it's complete. And was it, um, in, it was in a playable form? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, and I had all the art files and everything and I was able to figure out the tools and like build it back into the game and go like, look, it worked, it was all there. Wow. Um, and we don't have comments that say why it was cut. I suspect, so this is a computer game from like late 80s, early 90s. So I, I, space is at a premium for floppy disks. I suspect this area was cut just to save space. But yeah. we don't know that from comments, but we do know that they were at least fond of it uh, based on uh, some comments that was like in memory of this room. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like someone had commented like in a way that, that expressed that they were at least a little bit remorseful that they had to cut this cool area of the game. Um, so yeah, you see a lot of cool stuff like that in, in the source. Wow. Um, another example is in, in that particular instance is just looking through the art files. Um, there's art for like characters that didn't make it into the game. There's also like early draft art for characters that are in the game that 
um, just survived in the folder because no one bothered deleting them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, picture of virtual boys. Oh, that was from uh, the, so the, the picture you're showing right now. Um, is actually just from Game Pro Magazine. Uh, and and, and I want to go back to that, actually, yeah. because this is actually fascinating because, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, back in the day when we kind of looked at Game Pro Magazine, they, I would probably say they probably skewed a little bit uh, younger toward, like, the demo. Yeah. Um, and so a few things that I you, I just want to spot out. You guys actually posted this on the Video Game History Foundation's Twitter, and it's very yeah. fascinating because this is, like, such a clean, high-res scan. Right. So well, it's and, not a scan. Oh, really? So what? What exactly? Uh, um, was the we, source? We have we have Game Pro's raw layout. Wow. Uh, so this was gifted to us uh, quite a while ago. Wow. Um, these these are the actual files that would uh, be exported and sent to the printer. Wow. So so this is why that, it's so amazing, like high quality of it of an image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it it's before it got printed. Yeah. Uh, so when you print, you know, you're converting that image into like colored dots that are overlaid, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're converting it into four colors and printing it. But that is the actual um, image that's in the magazine before it went to the printer. Wow. Um, and it's it's, a, know, it's such an amazing photo. I have to be honest with you because, like, you look back on it and it, it's it, it's so uh, the best way I can say this way I can kind of put it for someone who's into photography and then at the same time for someone who's into video games, it speaks like a thousand words uh, of like what you can kind of perceive in this image. Like and then on, on top of it, it's, yeah, it's like, it, it's such a moment in time. I get it, it's like the virtual boy and you know, people always yeah. say like, you know, it was a failure, but I believe, was this Space World or was this uh, CES? I'm not sure which, which trade show. Uh, was it, was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the first E3, it was E3 1995. Wow. And then on top of that, it came from Game Pro Magazine. So I think all the collections of the video game magazines that you guys are doing, especially from that era of like 80s and 90s and how much you've collected uh, and like have, you know, reopened the vault basically of memories back for people to kind of like see like what we kind of did not really look in full context back then. It's, yeah. You know, it's, it's fantastic. Um, there's actually even like one magazine that you found that I had no idea existed, which was a magazine dedicated to sport video games. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's oh, me. Yeah. was like, I can't believe like a publisher said, hey, you know what? We have enough content <laughs> to actually make a magazine off sports video games. Like, like there were actually like, like four of those. There were, there were actually like four sport game dedicated magazines that were all in like 96 or so. Like it was like four different publishers were like, maybe this is a market. And they tried and didn't didn't quite work i guess but yeah yeah totally there's, wow. there's a lot of these weird magazines like and, that and were but, you kind of aware of that already like just from memory or you just happened to come across it like hey did anyone know about this like i mean that like i think in most cases if i find a magazine and it's like wow this is so obscure it's not even on the internet it's just because of saved ebay searches you know like yeah. I, I i have an ebay search for I have several saved searches for video game magazines because that was such a focus. Um, and I've been collecting these far longer than the foundation has been around. I've been collecting video game magazines since about 2002 or something like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, like the sports magazines when I like, there's one in particular that I found that again, literally just not even a Google result. And I, I found like four issues of it. <laughs> you know? it like, that was one of the sports magazines. One of the, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but going back to sort of like seeing history and, and, and clarity and stuff like that with, with E3, um, this stuff is just surprisingly rare. Like a lot of people attended these shows, but um, we don't have a lot of like footage or photography uh, of these shows. These were these big shows where, you know, most games were shown for the first time ever. Uh, and we, we don't have a lot of documentation about it. Like we, I had, I had this conversation with, um, the History Channel, I think it was last year, was working on like a, a special about the history of video games. And uh, the person who was talking to me just kept asking, like, where do I find footage of CES? And it's like, you know, it, it almost, it, it's so dire that like, I think she didn't even believe me when I was just like, nobody has that. 
Yeah, <laughs> there, there's no such it, thing. You, you checked like Getty Images or uh, like yeah. Wire Images, and they don't really have much of a, a big archive nope. of, of stuff even before E3 98, maybe, I guess. Like, right. it's, yeah. it's really bare out there. And E3 95, you know, not just being the first, but how like pivotal that was for the video game industry yep. being like the introduction of the PlayStation and the Saturn for uh, North America. That was like a big, you know, moment in history. Uh, totally. Yeah, we actually recently did an interview with Trip Hopkins and, you know, he discussed that uh, during the PlayStation announcement, he was actually also in the room. And that was yeah. like, whoa, you're in the room as well. And like, that, that to us is like kind of surreal to know like the, all the big heads of all the big game companies were also in there. So we don't know a lot of the, the background and the context. And I actually even remember an article, I think it was maybe from, uh, not Game Fan. What's, uh, there's another magazine before PSM and before Gamer Buyer's Guide, Gamer's Buyer's Guide. I forgot what the name of it. There's a lot of them. Game so. players, game players. Game players, yeah. Yeah, and, and it told a great story about E3 that like the, the executives between Sony and Sega, they were like trashing the, um, like each other's promotional materials like in like the night before E3. I mean, it's those stories that, you know, are like lost in these magazines that are just out there. That, yeah. you, that you're basically collecting is is there any kind of video game magazine that you feel has been like really hard just to find or you know just obtain yeah. like we like you, you're well aware about it but for some reason it's just you can't can't get it like it's just been physically out gone <laughs> yeah there's a there's a lot i mean especially if you expand the scope really far you know mm -hmm. like um if you're expanding it to include like i don't know local computer group zines you know what i mean yeah. like the the like nebraska atari 800 club <laughs> you know like, <laughs> like if, you're, if, you're, if you're if you're expanding it that, that far like yeah there's things that are definitely just gone gone right um i don't think there's ever any notion of like we have every printed thing that talked about video games it's like that's impossible um but in terms of just like this is a known quantity. It's by people that we've heard of. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. if, you, if you narrow it down to that, yeah, there's still plenty of things that are just like crazy hard to find. Um, so one good example is that uh, because we're the video game magazine archive, for better or worse at this point, right? Um, we we try to make sure that we can represent some sort of the... the uh, more important publications, the, the more influential ones in their entirety. Uh, so Electronic Gaming Monthly, uh, to a lot of people, myself included, was, you know, maybe the most influential of, of a certain period. Yep. Um, no one can forget their uh, console ratings, like that annual buyer's guide that they yeah, always do. Yeah. It was always like, what rating will the Atari Jaguar get? <laughs> and, you know, what rating well, will the Dreamio get? It was such a cool and what time. fascinates me most about EGM is that uh, they were really into the idea of being able to show a picture of every game announced, period, right? So um, Ed Semred, who was the editor-in-chief, uh, you know, he was, his background was photography, and so he would go to trade shows and make sure that EGM had a photo of any game that, like, existed right uh so if you go back and look through egm there's just all these lost games that no one would know what they look like if not for egm's photography so like that's wow. what i really love about egm but going back to your question um you know because egm is such as such an influential piece of the video game media uh we try to make sure that we can represent its history as well um and so really rare magazines actually came before EGM that were, that had a lot of staff uh, over, uh, not overflow, but, you know, a lot of the same staff, right? Mm. Um, and in fact, before EGM was a magazine called Electronic Game Player, only lasted mm. four issues. Um, I barely ever see these. We only just finally finished our set of four. We were missing issue two, which I just happened to have behind me. Wow. Um, and check out that. And here's the other cool thing I love that you guys show on uh, your social media accounts for the Video Game History Foundation is like all the art. You yeah. Know, whether it's the covers or it's like the ads that are in them. It's, it's probably some of the coolest time capsules like 
you know, and it, it's, you know, I'll be honest, like it's maybe like the nineties and early 2000s. So it's not that long ago, but it's like, it's almost like, wow, I can't believe we somewhat overlooked a lot of these things, you know, yeah. from just an artistic perspective. Um, it's like, it's, it's, oh, I'll be honest, like I get lost in your Twitter feed, just like kind of just <laughs> going like, you. oh my gosh, what, <laughs> what is Frank finding next? You know? Yeah, a lot of the art that we uh, put up there is actually, we have a lot of uh, digital promotional art. Um, we we have, over the years, uh, gotten a lot of press kits that were on CD or like zip disc or whatever that were sent to the media um, that have a lot of that stuff. So, you know, you're show, you showed the, the photo earlier. Um, yeah, it's, it's in higher res than we're used to, but it's actually fairly low res because it's like Game Pro's 1995 scan of their film. You know what I mean? It was like a crappy scan. Yep. Um, but in a lot of these press kits, um, because the art was meant for print as opposed to online, um, there's just really, really high resolution art that's on these press kits going back to like 95 uh, that you know, is way higher res than you're ever going to see anywhere else. Like, it's bigger than necessary. Um, and, and just out and of curiosity, see, like, when yeah. you look at press kits from, like, the mid-90s, what medium were they usually provided in? As in, like, file format? or uh, Well, like, were they on diskettes? Were they on CDs? Like, uh, like all of all of the above. Um, we don't tend to see the floppy disks too much mm -hmm. anymore um, because, I mean, this just got tossed, right? But, um, but we have definitely archived um floppy disks of press assets going back to maybe 95 uh more than floppy though you see film from that era wow um, so they were sending out film and yes <laughs> yeah wow um so depending on the need like the most common would be a slide yeah like a 35 millimeter slide um so that's where you know if you're looking at old magazines you're looking at screenshots uh almost entirely if, if they were provided by the publisher, they, they were almost certainly on slide, on 35 millimeter slide. Um, but if it's like cover art, uh, they would often send them on like four by five transparencies. Um, we even have a few like eight by 10 transparencies, which, you know, you're into photography, like that's a crazy amount of detail. Wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, eight by 10. Wait, and why would they have, why would they have that size to begin with? Like who, who would they be sending that that could is going to utilize something that 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 big theoretically it might have just been to make it easier to make a cover you okay. know like you don't have to do any scaling we know what it's going to look like you know it yeah. might have just been a control thing right like yeah. we know if we give you eight by ten or eight and a half by eleven or whatever that it's going to look exactly like that if you gotcha. print that gotcha. as a cover. I mean, that's my guess anyway but um but four by five film like that's enough for like a poster you know yeah. like that's <laughs> or like a billboard you know like like it, like you can get a lot of film grain in, in four by five uh so we have you know quite a few of those also um but that's that tends to be what, how the assets were delivered up through uh the mid 90s you get a little bit of floppy around then uh you start seeing zip disc when that's a thing um but then by like maybe 97 98 it's almost entirely cd roms Gotcha. Um, and so even and for those almost, prior those prior formats, are you guys having to like now just also get all the equipment just to be using them? So it's <laughs> yes. that's, I'm sure that's saving a lot of space. <laughs> yeah. I mean floppy three and a half floppy is not yeah. too bad. Um it's so it's just, it's surprising how well supported that format still is. You can get USB drives that still work um for three and a half um five and a quarter i don't know if i've ever seen press assets on five and a quarter but from a developer perspective we've had yeah. to do that um i actually have a really cool one next to me um as you can imagine my desk is just like filled with I, cool stuff I, I wish i could be there right now because i think i would could be there i could quarantine there for two weeks and still <laughs> not be enough of like what I'm learning. It's, it's just so like <laughs> fast. I, I'm telling everyone that's watching this video now and watch, we'll be watching it later on YouTube. You have to see kind of the feed that you guys post on your feed as well as on the Video Game History Foundation's feed. It's just like, 
you know, a plethora of like knowledge that like no one really realizes until like you guys bring it up. Um, you well, thank you. And yes. it's like, you know, we, we don't even do that much of it, honestly, because mm -hmm. what we're not trying to be the the resource that like creates content. We're trying to be the resource that That's gives safe. tools to people yeah. to go make content with. And mm -hmm. so when we're um, posting on, on, on social media, like cool art and stuff like that. Um, it's really just to get people excited by the idea that like, Hey, I could be doing this. You know what I mean? So like, uh, I guess, I guess I'm saying that cause it's like, we're just kind of scratching the surface even when, when we surface that stuff on yes. social media. It's, it's really just like teasers for the potential of this archive. Um, so really what we're doing is just trying to show like, Hey, this is the kind of things that we're looking for that we're that we're saving that we want you to be able to access and use. Uh, the thing I was pulling, by the way, earlier, just because I was mentioning floppy, is uh, we were recently gifted this floppy that has the source code for Boulder Dash. Um, wow. <laughs> so this is the original source for the Commodore sixty four version of Boulder Dash, um, and this is what was. Uh, sent to the programmer who ported it to the ColecoVision. Um, unfortunately, there are bad sectors on here. It's probably corrupt. Um, yeah. It's probably actually ir irrecoverable. Um, I haven't gone too crazy on it yet, um, but you know, it, it's kind of more of a cool trophy than it is data maybe if it's corrupt. But Do, do you guys um, check but, like old hard drives by any chance? Like if someone said, hey, yeah. there's a bunch of hard drives over here, just take them. Yeah. <laughs> you want to see some? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's uh, and that's another thing we try to we try to um, offer that uh, that I think here's the thing about video game preservation: like the majority of it is going to happen way better than we could ever do it uh, just out in the community. You know what I mean? Like people who are out there. Uh, just uh, getting getting this stuff and scanning it. Like we don't have time to like scan magazines, for example. We just yeah. don't have the resources. So like a lot of that work is gonna happen out in the preservation community, not within us. Uh, but what one of what we try to provide is like, well, what can we do that maybe the community at large can't? And and a lot of that just comes down to uh, first of all, I work, you know, been working in the industry for 15 years or something like that. So like, you know, I, like I'm, I'm sort of known and trusted within that community. But second, um, we, since you mentioned hard drives, uh, you know, one situation that we encounter sometimes is like, well, I mentioned that programmer earlier who's deceased, right? Yeah. So like the family entrusted us with hard drives from his computer that have personal data. You know what I mean? So like, that's not a situation where it's like, dump the hard drive and put it online and let people like rifle through it. It's like, well, we need to be the sort of curators and caretakers of yeah. that information. We don't want people to see that. There's no reason to see this guy's private data. Yeah. Um, and you need someone trusted so, that's, you know, people can count on and rely on yeah. that it, with these like, yeah, exactly. type of sensitive information technically. So, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to say that like the game preservation community is trustable. Of course they are, but like w there needs to be this, sort of name and face on it and website that like, you know, people can point at and go that guy, you know what I yeah. mean? And, and, and that to me is, I mean, I even mentioned that earlier when you're asking like, how do you get this stuff? And, and, and I said the sort of the secret sauce is just being vocal and there, yeah. you know, so that people like, oh, those, you know, like when something comes up in someone's life, they go, oh, who was that guy? You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's, and, that, and, that's, that's, yeah. that's, and to date, what's been kind of the most like, whoa, like the, it gave you shivers when someone said, hey, Frank, you need to check this out. Like what's been the one thing that so far today, maybe not, you don't have to say a future project, but something that right now has like, <laughs> it still excites you even thinking like, wow, I can't believe I stumbled upon this right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one of the future projects that, uh, is uh, the source to um, the game that was maybe most influential to me personally. So that was oh, uh, uh, of my life. Um, Let's see, uh, the, we have a paper collection from Mike Dietz, who was uh, art director at Shiny and before that Virgin Games. And um, uh, 
among what's in there is the hand-drawn animation frames for the Aladdin game on the mm. Sega Genesis. Mm. Um, that to me was was just amazing because it's like you know oh that's what those sprites actually look like you know <laughs> and, and it's like oh you can and some of it I think is actually from Disney Animation so it's like wow these are actually Disney Animation drawings that are in my office that's crazy wow um I'm, I'm just trying to think because it's like the wow moments it almost feels like you have a wow be... moment every <laughs> every phone call that you could possibly be getting yeah, could be like another wow like moment a... <laughs> that's the whole idea right um uh a uh, good one was um a friend of mine marcus uh he worked at nintendo for a while and he was the one who localized um earthbound he wrote the english script for it um and he still had the disc that he worked from uh when he was doing his work uh with the like scripting files for earthbound that came from japan um and that and, and he you know he put it in a drive and he's like oh i deleted everything um do you <laughs> and, but he donated it to us because he's like you know just in case you could do something with this and if you can't maybe it's just kind of a trophy piece somewhere yeah. but um the thing about floppy disks or hard disks or just disks in general even like the hard drive in your computer right now uh is when you delete something uh you don't actually wipe it from the drive mm -hmm. it's it's there it's just kind of like inaccessible now and is uh, waiting to be overwritten by other stuff. Luckily, Marcus, uh, he deleted all the Earthbound files, and he and he started one new file, but it was just this tiny notepad file. It was like two sentences, and that's all that was on there. Uh, so we were able to recover the entirety of the disk, every sector, mm. and reassemble the deleted pieces, and we actually recovered Earthbound's scripting files Wow! <laughs> like, <laughs> from deleted data and they were complete. Um, so that, that was a, that was a nice, like the, the wows don't tend to be like a thing handed to me. The, the wows tend to be uh, digging through something and, and finding something incredible and contextualizing it or like the polygon man napkin. Yeah. <laughs> See, <something laughs> that like was the most incredible. Like, it's just amazing that when uh, you guys posted this on the Twitter, it's just like, it's something that no one thinks about. It's a napkin that was probably put on, you know, promotional, you know, a promotion for a table, right? Yeah, it was, it was probably at a party at E3, <laughs> is my guess. Um, I'm trying to see if I have that in here. I don't think I do. Um, but that was uh, held on to the, held on by this guy. Um, Sorry, I was grabbing these from the floor. Um, that was someone who, uh, oh, there's me sniffing. I, this is a, um, a crazy photo too, but I, also, I want to ask you about this. You're literally sniffing, uh, I think there's an N64 cartridge maybe in that plastic bag, but it's No, like, that, that's that's an ET dug up in the dump. Oh, oh it's garbage. <laughs> what it's not. Uh, like. sniffing, I'm sniffing ancient garbage. Because <laughs> um, Mike who owned it was like, oh, you got to smell this, it's really bad. <laughs> um, so the, the Polygon napkin really quick, the Polygon Man napkin. Um, that was held on to by someone who was just a pack rat. You know, he just went to trade shows. And if there was like paper he could grab, he just grabbed it and kept it. Um, so a lot of things only survived because people had sort of like hoarder tendencies, God bless them. Uh, so that, that's why that Polygon man. Thank you, exists. thank you hoarders <laughs> for running yeah, out there. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's a situation where, um, cause you know, I've, all, I've also been involved in the like, the collector community and the, the like retro gaming enthusiast community for a really long time. I've been, my first classic gaming expo was the first one in 99. Mm -hmm. uh, technically there was World of Atari the year before, but like, you know, I've been going to like these retro gaming shows since 1999. Like I, I I'm, I'm connected to that community as well. And that Polygon Man napkin is not something that the foundation owns, yeah. um, but it's something that's in the collection of a collector who um sees us as sort of that trusted source to um sort of analyze his collection and like digitize it if we need to and stuff like that so that's a really comp uh, important component of what we do as well so let's say um, something like that napkin i know it's yeah. like the simplest thing would you guys go into like literally like research about like hey 
does anyone know where this napkin was? Does anyone know uh, like what event it was coming from? Like, do you guys like go even like in depth for something that could be literally no one has just thought about it? Could we just see a piece of gum that just says PlayStation on it? But let's let's go dig into the if we're working on a if we're working on a project where that napkin might help, <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know what I mean. But like. In, 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 but in practical terms, no, we just don't, we can't do that for, I mean, we have, I forget what our last estimate was, but we're counting every individual thing. You know, we have like 50,000 items, you know, we can't like, wow, get complete context for everything. Yeah. Um, so for something like the napkin, let's just say that was like donated to us, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, the process would probably be that, um, we photograph it, we catalog it, and when we're cataloging, you know, we just make sure that it's uh, all the keywords are in there for someone who might be searching for something like this. So it's like Sony, PlayStation, Polygon Man, uh, promotional napkin or something like that, right? So like, and then, um, you know, we might, we might have the date as like uh, best guess 1995, right? So like, now, if someone is researching E395, right, or what PlayStation's marketing was in 95, or even the history of Polygon Man, mm -hmm. um, there's enough catalog with this item that if they're searching our catalog, they, they could, they'll find it. And then it's kind of on them if they, if they think they want to, like, expose the history of a napkin. <laughs> you know, to like to like go you, seek that information. You never but... know. <laughs> maybe, yes. Maybe not someone who may be into video games. You never know when someone may literally just be a napkin connoisseur may want to just look up information like that. So you never know. Or it might, yeah. So it might turn out that the graphic designer of Polygon Man is like Banksy or something. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, so like that like it could turn out something like that too. I give the same answer almost every time when like usually it's kind of framed as like what's the holy grail um I think the the unicorn and this is not something I expect to just find in the wild I expect this to come from within uh and be exposed is that I think exposing the unreleased Nintendo 64 version of Mother 3 uh, is sort of a unicorn slash holy grail for me because um, this is such a known quantity in terms of historical importance. Uh, we know that the the Earthbound series, you know, has touched a lot of people. It's 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 inspired entire communities and events and stuff like that. It's 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 a really influential game. It's 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 something that I'm confident. Uh, in 50 years, there's still going to be someone like talking about that game, even if it's just like talking about the highlights of the golden age or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so the original, so there was Mother on the Famicom, the NES, there was Mother 2, which is Earthbound on the Super Nintendo. And then they were doing the third one on the 64, and it got really far along. Uh, and then they canceled it uh, just because. I mean, I had actually read a developer roundtable that they published when they canceled it. It was like, they got really far, but it was just going to take so much more work uh, to get it over the finish line that they just couldn't justify it anymore. Mm. Um, but uh, we know that it was polished, it was playable. Um, in fact, in that interview, uh, Miyamoto um, says that he would like to display the demo that they finished uh that was like really polished and nice even though the game's not coming out he, he wanted to display it at space world just so that fans could see it for one last time um so we know that it was really far along and and we i suspect that most of the content was there it was just a matter of like rigging up the the cutscenes and 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 the 3d models and stuff like that so to me that's the holy grail because that represents uh, an early rough draft of the game that eventually came out on the Game Boy that I think would be um, really fascinating to study as an historian and, and uh, would give us, you know, a, a lot of insight into the creative process of, of Itoi, the, the, the director of the game, uh, that we wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, but the question was, how do people support the Video Game History Foundation? 
Um, and the the best way is to uh, check out our website, gamehistory.org. Um, if you're able to contribute financially, that's, of course, uh, very, very helpful. Um, but really, if, if that's not the case, just follow us on social media, you know, like, blast us out if we if we're uh if we need something and we're asking um and uh just be a part of the solution not the problem when it comes to history disappearing right on man right on so uh frank i want to thank you again for taking the time to be here today you know no seriously i could go on for days just talking to you about like everything that you have done um you know make sure that everyone who's watching this video uh now and later on to uh, check out Video Game History Foundation on their website and as well as across all the social media platforms, specifically though on Twitter uh, uh, and also Frank Cifaldi's uh, like Twitter as well. Um, some amazing work that you guys are doing out there. And uh, Frank also had a panel at LA Retro uh, last August. That full uh, panel is actually on YouTube right now that everyone can go watch. Uh, a lot of people, you know, really marveled at like all the information that you were providing there. So, you know, really great recap of that. And, you know, once again, uh, the work you guys are doing, you guys are not just saving video game history. You're really almost in a way uh, building up the art. You're really kind of, you know, cherishing the art of the medium that most people are, especially starting now, but also from years to come, they're going to look back and say, we really need this resource. And believe me, people yeah. will find a way to say, you know what, we really needed an archive uh, of like all these things that were like from the 80s and 90s, 70s, 60s, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, thankfully, you know, you're already doing it. You're already on it right now. So uh, amazing work that you guys and everyone at the foundation is doing. And, you know, we can't thank you enough for that, you know, especially us being a, you know, retro expo. But uh, yeah, Frank, thank you. Thanks for the support. Yeah. You know, Frank, thanks again for the time tonight. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing more of what you got coming up and, you know, checking out like everything, all the new knowledge that we're all going to learn. So cool. And then uh, invite me back when the show comes back. We absolutely will, man. We absolutely will. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. All right. Everyone, thanks, everyone. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.